Um, and it's just uh, really distressing to people that they feel compelled to eat like that in the middle of the night. And a lot of people, you know, say, oh, I've qu I quit smoking or I quit drinking, but for some reason, I just can't stop eating like this in the middle of the night. And so I think it was really, you know, just a gratifying feeling, one, to be able to describe it more comprehensively and develop diagnostic criteria for night eating syndrome. Um, and for people to feel like, oh, somebody knows what I'm talking about, right? Can you imagine going to the doctor and maybe you've had this experience with something else, but like going to the doctor and not be feeling like you could talk with that doctor about it because they probably aren't going to know what you're talking about and probably be just like, ah, just stop doing it. You know, just, just here, take some sleeping pills and sleep through the night. But what happens when you give people with night eating syndrome sleeping pills is they end up sleepwalking and eating. And it can be even worse, right? They, they could hurt themselves. They could eat non-edible food because they're not realizing what they're doing. So that's actually not what you want to do <laughs> with somebody with night eating syndrome. So I would say really just the body of work that we were able to do with developing assessment tools. We've developed um, screening instruments for night eating syndrome. We've tested um, different medications for treatment, specifically SSRIs. And we just developed a cognitive behavioral therapy for night eating, all of which I feel like has really made a difference in a lot of people's lives. So I, I really do feel fortunate to have been able to, to do that work. Um, what are, in your work, have you found that certain cultures or gender identities tend to have a higher frequency of developing eating disorders? And have you studied the influence of social and genetic factors in development of eating disorders? I don't do as much of of that work, um, you know, I work mostly with binge eating disorder and night eating syndrome. And what we find in those disorders is that it is split more evenly between men and women. We have, you know, when, if you're thinking about, um, you know, full range of, of gender identification, more work has been done on that with anorexia nervosa and bulimia nervosa. Um, and as you can imagine, some of like the, the differences that you would see in presentation with like body dissatisfaction, which is often a driver for disordered eating, has to do with gender specifics, like what parts of their body maybe they are not as happy with based on their gender identification. Um, and that's a really a burgeoning area of research. And I, I feel like in these next few years, um, we're gonna see a lot more coming in that area. Societally, you know, one of the questions that I've spent time with is just, you know, I have good colleagues in Italy and Israel and some in Spain. And we always just talk about the difference of timing of meals in different cultures. And can you have something like night eating syndrome? And what does binge eating look like in different cultures, given that, you know, in Italy, they're sitting down to dinner at 10 p.m., right? Like, can you still have somebody with night eating syndrome if that's the cultural norm? And you can, like, there are people who still wake up in the middle of the night and eat there. And that's, you know, that's pathological. That's not part of the societal norm. So those, I would say, are kind of more the areas that I've dealt with, with the kind of work that I've, I've done. Um, do you treat patients of all ages? If so, is there a particular age range of patients you see most often? We only treat adults at our center. CHOP has um, an eating disorders, a full range eating disorders program, um, and they're excellent there. So we see um, patients who are 18 and and up. And, um, you know, I, and I see people eight, 18 and into their seventies, right. Really across the, the full, the full gambit. And, uh, you know, you would think typically most anorexia nervosa and bulimia nervosa cases would be younger, but it's not necessarily the case. I've worked with men in their fifties with bulimia. I've worked with women in their sixties with anorexia. So, um, you know, the, Statistics are one thing, but in a clinical practice, anybody can walk through your door with any combination um, of these symptoms, which again, makes it really quite interesting and challenging, of course. I mean, you really wanna do right by people when they're, they're looking at you for help, so. But I do, I, I see a, a really wide range of, of folks who come in. But yeah, I didn't want, I mean, children and adolescents, I did a little training in grad school and I realized that wasn't the population I wanted to work with. So that's another thing to really just hone in on, like, you know, what are your strengths and what populations would you want to be dealing with? What are some of the lectures you've given for classes? So I, I've given lectures in psychology on 
mostly on weight and eating disorders. You know, people really, in the med school, I give the eating disorders lecture to the first year med students. Um, and then the more specialized lectures for the, when they're in their clerkship and to the residents. Undergrad, I give lectures in Dr. Carl's nursing seminar, obesity and society on um, pregnancy and obesity. And I used to give a lecture in Paul Rosin's class um, seminar in, in Department of Psychology on eating disorders and obesity. So it's mainly on those areas. And then I just give lectures kind of when invited at, at different institutions, which is really nice. Now we can do these virtually. I gave a talk today for 250 dietitians through one of their, the dietitian professional organizations. So right from the comfort of my own office. So that, <laughs> that's always nice. That I guess is a positive of, of all of this and being able to talk to you all like this is nice. Um, what are some of the interesting things you've seen or, or trends um, you've observed over the years? You know, I think as a field, work always evolves. And I, there were a ton of clinical trials when I was first starting in eating disorders. And I feel like the National Institutes of Health weren't then for a while funding as many clinical trials. They were funding more work to find like the mechanisms behind um, disordered eating and obesity. And, and so that's been a big shift in the field. And it's something that we've, that I as who was primarily trained as a clinician have had to shift along with it just to follow where the field is going and how to, you know, to keep your program of research funded. Um, and so I think we're looking, you know, a lot more at how like say fMRI can inform us what parts of the brain might be activated and then working, you know, trans, uh, you know, across different fields, maybe partnering with animal researchers to then figure out how to target those areas in the brain with different, um, perhaps different medication, you know, medication development, and then coming back to the clinical side and saying, okay, then how do we roll this out in a clinical trial and test this, you know, back in humans? And it, it becomes, you know, kind of this huge cycle is how, how do you participate in a translational um, research model and what, what part of the, that, that spectrum do you wanna be on? I'm still definitely on the clinical side, but I feel like um, really to make a go of it, you have to be well-versed in, in speaking to people across all of, you know, from the basic science, you know, to, to the laboratory, to field research and, you know, how then you end up um, implementing clinical trials. And I would say that's actually something that's developed quite a bit in these last several years is implement, implementation science, right? That's a huge and exploding field where you take work that we've been doing in the quote, ivy, ivy, ivory tower with bringing groups and participants into our centers and really how do you adapt those um, interventions to primary care offices or community centers or internet based interventions, right? So that they can be widely available to people out in the community because not everybody can come into an academic center for treatment. So how do you implement those, those types of studies? So I feel like, um, you know, all of that has been just kind of moving forward um, during my time. And um, let's see, let me open this next one, sorry. <laughs> Somebody wants to yell one out, they can certainly do that too. Um, as someone who focuses their work on eating disorders, a topic that is very stigmatized among the general public, what has been your experience when it comes to tackling misinformation and lack of awareness for patients and their families? How can students prepare themselves um, to their role as future physicians, scientists, and educating the public? You know, I think um, that's a great question. Uh, I, I hopefully have, we're trying to shop around an editorial right now. I was working with some other scientists, um, researchers looking at hospitalization rates over COVID for people with eating disorders. And they're actually, were quite elevated. Um, people were more likely to be hospitalized during this past year of the pandemic um, and had longer stays than the previous two years before the pandemic. And I think, People often do just kind of underplay eating disorders and 
think that they're under the agency of the people who had them more than say depression or anxiety and that it's just like maybe some kind of lifestyle choice. And it is a challenge, right? To get people to understand these are brain disorders, right? Who in the, who would willingly choose to live with the burden of this constant dialogue of how awful somebody looks or um, they're never good enough or they're always eating too much or um, just so many rigid rules about what you can eat, what you can't eat and just having to be perfect at it all, all the time. It's such a burden for somebody to carry around that I think if somebody, you know, people in the general public who make those assumptions really understood the burden of these disorders on quality of life and people's functioning, you know, that they would hopefully better understand, right? That this is a brain disorder with sociocultural components for sure, but um, that it's not just something that people are doing for attention. And I would say that is one of those huge misperceptions. I'd say the other thing is the field that we are always battling is just, you know, the pro eating disorder websites and just all of the attention on body shape and size that influencers have and how crappy it makes most of us feel, right? When we're seeing people who are photoshopped and putting themselves in the best light every day, you know, telling people how per easy it is to, to look perfect when it's just not, right? It's That's not real life. Um, so it, it is a challenge, right? To keep ahead of the curve with that. And I don't think as a field, we actually do a very good job of that. In Israel, the parliament actually passed a law a few years back where they have to, on advertisements, um, the advertisers have to state if, a, if something's been altered, if an image has been altered. We obviously don't do that here, right? We're very far from that. I think like CVS has made a pledge not to use Photoshopping in their beauty ads and their stores and things like that. But, you know, that's just the tip of the iceberg. So I, you know, whenever we can, I think we try to put that message out there. So like I said, we're trying to get this editorial to come out at the same time as the paper comes out next week. We'll see if we can get it to land anywhere. But I think it is our job as scientists to also communicate our findings to the general public in a digestible way so that we get the message right and that people really understand how serious these disorders can be. Um, have you managed to separate your personal life from your work life, given you work on such a difficult topic? You know, I think just in general, working in academia and having boundaries <laughs> with your regular life is also very important. I think I learned this early on. Um, I worked at a community mental health center in grad school for one of my practica, and it was just terrible, some of the lives, you know, that I saw. And it was hard not to bring those stories home. And I, and I think it was a conscious effort early on to say, hey, if I'm going to survive in this field... I have to know how to leave some of that at the door, right? And to realize I've done what I could do during the day and seeing these patients. I've talked with my supervisors if I've needed to or my peers to process it. And now, you know, for me to be psychologically healthy and to be able to give all that I can to these patients when I do see them, I need to have some boundaries. And so that was even something, you know, I worked with a mentor who worked six, seven days a week, you know, six days in the office at least, and every day just in general, you know, he was 80 year old man, right? And he had never had his own kids. And so I really had to put up my own boundaries and say, hey, you know, I'm having a family. I, you know, have little kids. Some days I'm gonna have to leave earlier. It's not that I'm not gonna get my work done, I will, but like life has to be a little more flexible. And I was very, um, I was calm about it, but I was, I was very much with my mind made up. Like if I'm going to do this, you know, I, I, I have communicated what my needs were and, um, they, he was very understanding. The director of our center was very understanding. And, um, I was like the only woman for a long time. They all kept peeling off and doing their own thing and I persisted, but I'd have to say it was not easy. It really wasn't. And um, I have a wonderfully supportive husband. He's a police officer, actually. He works rotating shifts. So it's not that that was easy, but he was very dedicated to, to you know being there as a father and we sorted it out, right? We divvied up the, the running around and the tasks and, um, we somehow made it work, but I think it does take a partner like that, right, to, to be an equal participant, um, to get everything done that you can to make sure that you, you can have a family life and 
that exactly wasn't exactly the question, but I think it's relevant in this conversation too, to be able to, to do all the things that you want to do. I'm aware we're getting at the close of the hour. I don't know. Let's see. Um, there were a couple more questions, but. Yeah, and we can do like two or three more questions um, if you'd like and call it at 830. That works. Okay. Yeah, I think there's just a couple more. Um, does clinical research have to follow HIPAA rules and regulations? So yes, um, it really does. Uh, you know, there's a lot of rules we actually have to follow about, um, you know, in our informed consent form, we have both, uh, we have a section for HIPAA. So we have to tell the patients exactly what personal health information we're gathering and how it's going to be stored. Um, and we have to de-identify data that we do store. And if we give it like to our biostatistician, we want to de-identify it, take off personal identifiers and so on. So um, absolutely for clinical research, we have to be very careful about um, how we, what personal health data we collect and and end up how we end up storing it. And then um, how would you advise somebody who has close friend or family member who struggles with eating disorders? You know, I think this is super tough because a lot of times people with eating disorders may be not ready for help. And um, I, the best thing you can do is advise somebody to use I statements so it doesn't make people defensive. So I noticed, right, that you used to eat meals with us and now you're, you have a, you know, you're always doing something else when we get together to eat. And I'm kind of, I'm concerned. I, I think I've seen you losing some weight and I just want to make sure everything's okay. So that's very different than saying, you are too skinny. I, you know, something's wrong. What's going on? That puts somebody on the defensive, right? So you really want to just make sure you stick with things that you're saying, I've noticed this, right? And I'm concerned and kind of leave it, lead that way. That leads for a more open discussion than putting somebody on the defensive by kind of jumping on them um, and saying, you're doing this, this, and this, right? So if somebody wants to talk to somebody about their eating disorder, I would lead with those questions and maybe also have some resources for possible referrals if somebody is then open to talking. Um, and I think it was that. I enjoyed both the clinical and the research, actually. That was the last question on the screenshot because um, I think they inform each other. So I think it's super important actually <laughs> to be doing both of them. That's just my opinion. I would be an epidemiologist probably if I didn't like the clinical work as much. <laughs> um, and I'm not sure about non-US foreign medical grads participating in clinical research. I actually, that's not a question I don't think I can answer. Um, sorry about that. Um, and I think there was just one other about common misperceptions about eating disorders or psychology in general. I think again, the probably the most common one is just that people are choosing, you know, these forms of eating um, and just want attention seeking. And it that really, even if in the beginning, you know, it's about wanting to quote unquote look good, it that's definitely not what it what it is once it develops into a full, full-blown eating disorder. It gets to be a thing unto its own that then is very difficult to change. So I would say that's probably the most common misperception. Did I get them all? <laughs> yeah, no, that was perfect. I mean, if anyone has any last minute questions, feel free to shout now, but we really appreciate you coming and speaking with us today. Um, we have a lot of people here interested in different fields of neuroscience. Um, so this was really great to have you. Awesome. No, you guys are, you know, it's, it, it's great to have a group like this and be able to have these discussions and be exposed to all different points of view. So um, good luck with, with all of your studies and whatever career paths you choose. Thank you so much. <laughs> all right. Have a great night, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.